Well, I really don't know. I do remember that Edie and I were at the Holiday Inn for his uh, victory party the night he was, the first time he was elected uh, Illinois senator. Mm -hmm. And I guess we just kind of kept in contact and then we became actively involved with the uh, Paul Simon Institute when he uh, came to Southern as a uh, retired senator. Uh, we met with him a couple of times in Washington when we were on different uh, trips there. So it was just a kind of an a usual gathering of the clan, so to speak. Uh, that's with a C, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate uh, the clarification. So we've just had a good, good relationship with both Paul and Gene, and uh, and then later uh, with Patty. So it's just been a, and we like to keep up with Sheila and and Perry. So I guess we're just friends of the family, so to speak. <laughs> after so long, you just kind of settle after into so that long, relationship, right? So. And since Edie and I came to Southern uh, for employment in 1969, so uh, that first time we were involved had to be in the early 70s. So, uh, but speaking to, about coming to Southern, it's kind of interesting because Edie and I were on a quote tour of the campus. Mm -hmm one Friday afternoon, and we got to Old Main, and I said, well, Eddie, Old Main's been here forever. We'll be here forever. We're due for, we're kind of late for that fish fry that we're due at, and that's down in Rosie Claire. So uh -huh. let's just, uh, let's just stop the tour now and start it back up on Monday. <laughs> well, Old Main burned on Sunday. What? Yep. Okay, all right. Well, before we get into that story, we're going to do the introduction for episode 75 of the WTF Carbondale podcast, where we talk to interesting people about their interesting lives and tie it all back to this little old place we call home, Carbondale, Illinois. Um, on this episode, uh, another Carbondale legend, uh, Emil Spees. And uh, yeah, I guess we just go right off into the burning uh, of Old Main, because that's, uh, that's quite the story to... To share. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't have been in town, or would you have been in town, when when that actually occurred? No, we were speaking, uh, spending the weekend down in Hardin County. Okay. Rosé Claire. <laughs> what was the feeling like when you got that, when you got that news that <laughs> that Old Main had burned? Well, kind of devastated. Yeah. You know, like unbelievable, and uh, and then of course tried to find something on television that might be covering it, which was not all that much at that time. Mm -hmm. And so it was just, and since I had worked as a student worker in the history department uh, for my undergraduate years, from the time I was a freshman till I was a senior, mm -hmm. uh, that was just like, part of me burned. <sighs> so yeah, it was devastating. I, I I I can I can feel the just the the palpable emotion, Emil. I I, I hadn't realized how, uh, just how how important that that facility itself had had been to SIU to that to that point. I mean, what what all had had been housed in that space to that point? Pardon? Uh, do you know what what all had been housed in that space to that point? <clears throat> well. I I really don't know because, see, that was, we had just come to Southern for employment at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember what was housed in it uh, when I was an undergraduate. Prior to. Uh, the first floor was home economics. The second floor was uh, uh, government and history. The third floor was English. And so th that's my remembrance of the building because that's, the building that I worked in mm -hmm. and knew as a student because I back then uh, as a student worker I I just came and went 
uh, between classes and other things I was doing, mm-hmm. and I had certain set hours, but any time that I had free time, I was usually right. either at the student center or in the history office getting caught up with things. <laughs> oh, I have another funny yeah. story to tell please, you. Please do. This is all about that. <laughs> Dr. Uh, uh, Rosenthal had just come to Southern from gotten his doctorate at uh, uh, at Harvard. Mm-hmm. And one Friday afternoon, he handed me some papers, and he said, uh, Mr. Spies, because back in those days, he still referred to students, uh, Mr. and Ms., mm-hmm. mm-hmm. uh, would you type this up for me tomorrow? And it was a Friday afternoon. And I said, well, sir, I don't come in on a Saturday. He said, what? I said, I'd be glad to do it, but I don't come in on a Saturday. And he said, I, I, pardon me? And so Dr. Pit, Pitkin was at his desk, and he looked up, and he said, Herb, what he's trying to tell you is he does not come in on Saturday. <laughs> and he said, oh, I, I, I see. <laughs> so that was his first lesson in Southern Illinois speak. <laughs> <laughs> because at that point, I, well, it was my freshman year, uh, so I was straight out of Hardin County. and How to kindly say no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Something of that sort. <laughs> but uh, so that's another little tidbit from uh, my undergraduate days. Uh, so to, to tell you, I, when you ask about when did I come to Southern, Uh, I came to Southern as a freshman in the fall of 1953, Mm -hmm. got my B.A. in 55 in history and government and English, uh, and then got a master's in student personnel work, which is now called student development. Mm -hmm. So I was here from the fall of 53 till the spring of 59 and swore I'd never come back again. <laughs> and 10 years later, I'm back as a employee in the Student Affairs Division. Uh, but the 50s were interesting. Uh, people talk about that as being the silent generation. Mm-hmm. And I think we were. And being the silent generation, I think we got a lo- away with a lot of things that now, uh, Oh, there's so many rules and regulations, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and mm-hmm. da, da 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 And back then, there were rules and regulations, and they were enforced, and we had hours and so forth. But we also had fun. Uh, on my 21st birthday, uh, two graduate students in the history department took me to every bar in town to celebrate my 21st birthday. And of course I had been in every one of those bars for four years. <laughs> and starting with a place that used to be called Whiskey Bills mm-hmm. because the uh, Alpha Phi Omega, which is the APO Scout for, uh, Service Fraternity, mm-hmm. we met every uh, Thursday night. And then after the meeting, we would go down to Whiskey Bills and have a schooner or a beer. And since I was small, I always was set in the middle. So if somebody happened to walk through, they wouldn't even see that I was sitting there less on that I had a beer. <laughs> so so it's, and- a, it's, a, it's a pretty long standing Carbondale tradition to make your way into the bar at a particular age and participate in things that may not be. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And it, of course, remember it was a much smaller place then. Much uh, everybody knew pretty much everybody about doing everything. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and it was the era, era of Dick Gregory, and uh, when he was a track uh, a star, and both before and I was here when he was here first, and then he went to service, and then he came back. So, uh, and. Since I was very much involved in the student center and uh, spent a lot of time there, of course, I ran into Dick practically all the time, day in and day out. So, uh, as I say, you know, everybody kind of knew everyone. Uh, so, 
but that doesn't mean there weren't some bad things and there were but there were so many good things and uh, although uh, faculty called you mister or miss I never felt there was a faculty member that I couldn't talk to or uh, ask questions to or <laughs> be told no emo that's not the way you do it <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing or rather no Mr. Spees. Did, did uh, that kind of influence the approach that you had to working with the student body when you came back in 69 and subsequently worked through uh, you know, at SIU until, until retirement. I mean, do you feel like your early years at SIU really led to, uh, you know, the, the formation of your later years at SIU in your approach to higher education? Oh, definitely. Uh, and <clears throat> as I said, I did the, what was in a two years master's program in student personnel, student development. And my first year, uh, I was a resident assistant uh, in what was called uh, Illinois Avenue, which was right on the Illinois Street. Mm -hmm. And then the second year, I worked uh, actually in the student affairs office with uh, Miss Mullins, who was the director of student activities. But in my undergraduate years, I worked with Dr. Greenleaf. Uh, of course, got to know uh, Dean Davis very well. Uh, uh, and so they were, they were just very good people to know. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I mean, and you, and you would have and, been... And they were good role models, although they, they wouldn't have referred to themselves as role models. <laughs> they just kind of lived it. And yeah. you were there to follow along. Right. Were, was, there, was there time that you spent... I mean, because this would have been the, the Delight Morris years as well. Or, a absolutely. Like, so, er, er, I mean... Well, can you refresh me on when those years were? Because it was like '48 that he came, and he was here until the mid '70s, or, or what was the what was the layout on that? Do you recall? Well, of course, I, I wasn't here when he came, Fair. but everybody knows the story of how he he came, and everybody knows the, the sad story about his later years when he had what we now would refer to as dementia. Mm -hmm. But he was a strong leader. Uh, I mentioned Alpha Phi Omega, the Scott, the Scout fraternity. We went on three, three-day horseback trips with Dr. Morris, three different years. So you, that was the kind of person he was. Uh huh. Now I'll have to admit he didn't remember names, but then again I don't either. <laughs> but uh, one of my, well, a dual fraternity member because he was an Alpha Phi Omega and. and he and I both were in Delta Chi. We were setting up for a reception uh, in the Morris backyard, which was not unusual at all. Uh -huh. And I said to Don, I said, well, Don, do you think we'll uh, come back? Do you think? And Don said, ah, we can. Dr. Morris won't remember us, that's for sure. <laughs> and this voice behind us said, Don, emo. Dr. Morris will certainly remember you. He looked up and there was Mrs. Morris. <laughs> <laughs> and he did remember us. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Uh, just to just to stick out like that and to yeah. think to, you know, to 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 even feel like you've taken up just the smallest amount of of memory in, you know, a a person's life who has been so influential in so many facets of a place. That's a <laughs> need to think on. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I, I knew him as somebody who went horseback riding, but I also knew him as the uh, benevolent dictator uh, in his office when mm -hmm. we had to deal with those kind of things. But I will uh, underline benevolent. <laughs> Now, when when you and Edie came back in 69, did both of you have jobs lined up with Southern? Was that part of what drew y'all back or, or how how did that all how did that all work out? Well, um, Edie and I were visiting Southern Illinois and then on our way back to uh, California uh, and 
we went by to say hello to Dr. Graham, who insist, Dr. Jack Graham, who insisted that we pay our respects to the dean of students. So we went over and met Dr. Wilbur Moten, and Wilbur said to me, uh, to us, as we were leaving, well, if something happens and you decide not to take that job in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, uh, by all means, give me a call because there's some things here I'm sure you all would enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And we said, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> well, um, there was a real big shakeup at Penn, and the job, the president called me and said, uh, if you want the job, it's still yours, but I knew you were especially wanting to work with uh, the the dean here. So long story short, I said, thank you. I'll call you back. I called Wilbur, told him the story, and he said, asked me how much I was going to get paid at Penn, and I told him, and he said, okay, that will be your starting salary uh, if you'd like to join us in June uh, this year. And we, I said, well, yes, that would be very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how we came back, came, uh, how I came back, how we came. And Edie, of course, had her doctorate in uh, psychology. Uh, and the halftime coordinator or whatever, what was then called handicapped students, mm -hmm. I had just accepted a job with uh, the Cardinals in St. Louis. And Wilbur said, well, Edie, you've got a PhD. Uh, how about if you come on and, and run that? You'd, we'd offer it to you full time huh. rather than half time. And he and Edie talked and she did some interviewing. And so the, her, she was the first full-time, what then was called director, uh, and it was called Handicapped Student Services. And so since she had the PhD and she knew faculty members, they, they would permit the students to take tests in her office because she could supervise them. Huh. So it was a very interesting time. And of course, it was the time of the riots. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, the first uprising was when students were rebelling against ours at the, in the residence halls, and that was kind of mild compared to what happened later. And <laughs> then we were here uh, when Kent State, and the riots were a big thing. Uh, they really helped shape the post-riot university, as well as doing away with some of the really good things of the pre-riot in, in uh, university. Uh, Edie was in her office at Moody Hall and helped carry uh, a couple of uh, persons in uh, wheelchairs down steps because they couldn't go out the front door because that's where the protesters were, where they're standing in front of the uh, Woody Hall, and mm -hmm. uh, she couldn't come out the front. I was in the crowd in the front, <laughs> and uh, uh, Chancellor McVicker was walking around, and anybody he saw he knew, he'd say, oh, now go back to your office. Be e it'll be easier if you all will just go back to your offices, and uh, uh, we'll deal with the students. Well, some of us were there to, quote, work with the students to... Uh, help solve some of the problems, but it was a very difficult time. Uh, and the night of the big, uh, well, I was over at the residence hall the night of the gassing, and we would tell students, you may leave the hall, but once you leave the hall, you may not come back in. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a bad situation. And then in another night, there was a, the night you get all the pictures of all the students down st downtown and going up the railroad tracks and so forth. Well, I was on campus at kind of uh, the operational house where all the people 
we orange bands on there, which said, you know, we're not rioters, we're mm-hmm. here to help. Uh, that's where I was. We had a uh, civilian uh, viewer at the police station. Uh, and Edie, that happened to be Edie's job that night, and she was told, now dress, uh, we don't want you looking like you were dealing in a riot, we want you to look like a professional. Mm -hmm. So she, and no shorts, no slacks at that time. So she went home and got her outfits like she wore to work every day. Mm -hmm. And the police were taking down the numbers of the shells on their bullets and saying to her, well, lady, we don't really know what's gonna happen and we can't say that we can protect you, but one thing you can do is you can get down under this desk and we will push it against the wall and that'll be about the safest place you can be. Now, as it turned out, uh, the riots didn't reach the police station and uh, the, the night ended and that was the night before. And this is another thing people forget. The university did not close. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the university prematurely suspended classes. And there was a reason for that. Mm-hmm. By not closing, but suspending classes, then you could give grades for that semester. Now, a lot of people ended up with just a pass fail, I think most, which, you know, that had repercussions in terms of graduate work or in terms of jobs or so forth. But also it meant that the university did not have to return uh, tuition to those students because we were prematurely suspended and wasn't and we weren't closed as mm-hmm. a university. So there's all kinds of interesting stories about the riots and uh, I think the students we our students were so much better behaved. Uh, we had a lot of agitators from out of town. Uh, We had the National Guard. Uh, It was a really rough time. And when I read some of the things I read about the history of the university, and they say, oh, here's the picture of the students downtown during the ride. And it looks, and actually it's a picture of the students years later where they were downtown because they were closing the bars. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, well, nothing really happened. Well, a lot happened. It, it created a lot of problems and a lot of pain. Uh, after the riots were over, uh, we in student affairs, and I'm sure also many faculty members, actually went for, into town, into southern Illinois, or into, also up in northern Illinois, to talk about the university and why it was a good place to come, and it was safe, uh, and uh, come on back. So, you know, that was a, that was a way that the, the students and the faculty and administrators were involved in after riot, uh, recruitment of students to either come back or to, to enroll. So So was, was, was the community outreach function of SIU something that happened only after the riots then it wasn't something like like when you see pictures that are like you know uh, so and so professor speaks at you know x small town in this year 1975 or what have you it it, it to was that something that was only occurring after the riots not before them or was it something where they program that was occurring before these riots then just took a different shape on after the riots to kind of do a, a, a face saving exercise of, of, of reaching out to all these different communities around the state and saying, no, uh, really you, you should be participating with us. Are you still, uh, well, it was both, uh, Dr. Morris spoke at my high school graduation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a lot of faculty were engaged in, commencement speaking, uh, Rotary, Lions Club, uh, all kinds of clubs uh, to as kind of 
outreach to the community. And in one of the things that at, in that the Morris period was that service to the community was very, very important. Mm -hmm. It was teaching, research, and service. And uh, faculty, staff were encouraged to join community groups. Mm -hmm. And when you, your dossier uh, or your uh, VITA was looked at, uh, service was looked at. Mm -hmm. Did the, Was this person a community-involved person? Mm -hmm. Was this person com involved with students? That was an important part of your being part of the community, mm -hmm. of SIU being part of the community. Is this something that, that I mean, because I, I would assume that you've got relationships with, you know, faculty and staff the, the country over that, you know, have been in different places at different times in higher education. Is, is the focus on service something unique to Southern, something unique to us, or something that you at least wouldn't find very common out at all of these other universities at the time? This, this idea of service uh, as, as part of your CV? Well, I think service is always part of the, any, any university's mission, mm -hmm. and they all mention it. But it was during the 50s, and I wasn't here in, in the 60s until 69, mm -hmm. but during the 50s, it was a very much encouraged uh, several years later, when I was a faculty member, uh, I was on the promotion committee that read the papers and said, yes, I, we think this person should be put up for promotion or this person is lacking in an A, B, or C. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking to Dean Beggs, and I said, Don, I want to point out something to you. There's only one curriculum vita that mentions involvement of students outside the classroom. And this was a, uh, and she was uh, the uh, faculty advisor to, the, to an honorary. Mm -hmm. That was the only mention of involvement with students outside the classroom. Mm. And because it wasn't important. Yeah. We were going to become a Carnegie uh, research institution and research was going to be more important. In fact, I had a, mm -hmm. uh, a boss once, and I always taught summer school locally, and Dr. King said to me one morning, Emil, I don't know how you could have such a suntan if if you spend any time in the library. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, Dr. King, I go to the library in the evening. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, that, that was the, when I became a faculty member, that, and I think service is important and I think you can be, and I think research is important uh, and teaching is important. But you can't say, well, you can't say, well, of course, everybody's a good teacher. Uh, no, <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> I've been there. I've done that. Thank you. I know this. <laughs> yes, from experience. But to just make that assumption that uh, teaching is important are well done, I should say, because of course it's important. Mm -hmm. So, any, I th and now remember, I've been retired for uh, since 1969, so I can't speak to the current situation at the university in terms mm -hmm. of promotion. But I do know at a time, I felt very much that uh, students were not as involved with faculty and faculty not as involved with students. Uh, I'll give you another example. 
Uh, the uh, Delta Chi fraternity gives three or four scholarships, uh, and one and the student has the member has to apply, and one of the requirements was three letters of recommendation from faculty members. Mm -hmm. We dropped that because again and again we would have seniors who would say, I don't know a faculty member well enough to ask them to write a letter of recommendation. Mm -hmm. Now that's sad. That's do you, do you sad. feel like your work had an active impact on changing that mindset, on changing that application? And, and the reason why I, why I asked that, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, some of the good relationships that you would have had, but I, I've had a number of different folks who have different recollections of different times at SIU. And it seems like one of the common themes coming back is, well, the reason why I'm so involved at SIU is because somebody did take time to reach out to me. Somebody did invest some effort. Somebody did identify a value in me that I may not have otherwise identified. And so they say, oh, well, yeah, come back and do your master's. At, at Carbondale or what have you, and, they, and these students feel welcome to do so because they have a relationship. Do you feel like work that you did over, over the course of several decades shifted that at all, that mindset? I, I really don't know. All I can say is that my feeling is that students now are not Do not have that personal relationship with faculty that I had. Yeah. Now, again, I'm observing, I'm not there, That's and right. I'm sure you will find lots of faculty members who will respond to you. That is just not true, and I hope that happens. Yeah. But uh, uh, when you work on a scholarship committee, and again and again, you have outstanding students who because you couldn't get the scholarship unless you had a B plus, uh, a B or a B plus average. Mm -hmm. And here would be people, kids, students, who weren't, who were in those classes that were in their career path, mm -hmm. telling me that they didn't know them well enough to get that, uh, they could get a recommendation in terms of the career path mm -hmm. and I'd say that was fine but they couldn't get a personal I know this person to be this I know this young man yeah. to be a good person who works hard in my class da 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 yeah. no. the, the the personal recommendations that folks need to really springboard into a career springboard into uh, the next phase of education whatever it may be yeah, the career path, but the personal. Now, remember, I said that I worked four years as a student worker in the history department. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So my relationship with all the faculty that I worked with, I worked for, and I had classes with, for, and under was probably a, a lot different because I knew them as people. Yeah. Uh, but, but I also knew faculty members who were not in the history department. I knew faculty members in the government department. I knew faculty members in the English department who I felt I could talk to on a person-to-person -person relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very, very active in student activities. And of course then, I knew the director of student activities. I knew the dean of women. I knew the dean of men. So I because I worked with them. Yeah. Uh, so I maybe had a very different uh, undergraduate career than most people, but I, but I don't think so because my peers had this, the same kind of relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, and we weren't all of the goody good kids. We were <laughs> real normal developing adolescents mm -hmm. uh, and who were slowly becoming uh, 
slowly but surely becoming senior citizens. Well, I think you're still a developing adolescent after all this time, Emil. <laughs> uh, the way that Liz talks about the way you and the boys run around makes me it makes me think you're just as young as you've ever been. <laughs> well, I must say it is uh, it, it is great to uh, live with your grandsons, or or for other people, grandchildren, but. My grandchildren happen to also be grandsons, <laughs> so I can say that. And oh. uh, uh, it keeps me a little up to date. Uh, I was once amazed that a f faculty member didn't know who Doris Day was. And I thought, how could you not know who Doris Day is? <laughs> and now I have grandsons who mention some television star or some uh, rock and roll or music that they listen to and I think I don't have the faintest idea who you're talking about <laughs> but I'll, I'll if I sit here and listen or stand here and listen I'll probably get to know who that person is so yeah, only so much media is tolerable anymore though you, yeah. you may, it may or not may, it may or may not be your cup of tea but that's okay to each their own right yeah <laughs> So the uh, while while we're talking about the boys, so have they have they been wrenching on the the old VW thing? Then is that it, are, are they are they part of why it's in running condition right now? Have they been polishing oh, oh, up at all? You're talking about the, yeah the the Volkswagen yeah. thing. No, that uh, Logan purchased an old truck that was owned by a forest ranger. Uh -huh. This truck, they weren't even sure they would be able to drive it all the way from the place in Missouri to get it to Murfreesboro, mm -hmm. but it made it. <laughs> uh, Logan has redone the bodywork. He's taught, he's taught himself how to weld and how, and all kinds of things, but he has a lot of uh, men that he goes to, I say men because they are men, mm -hmm. uh, and say, oh, well, how do I do this or how do I do that? And so he's become, uh, has a good relationship with a lot of people about cars and good. trucks and so forth. Uh, but the thing, uh, we still have it. It still works. Uh, the license plate is some 12 years out of date, but... <laughs> One of the things we're going to do before my birthday in July is uh, get that thing uh, license plate renewed so we can take the top, put the top down and enjoy uh, October, November, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> before it goes too cold again meanwhile i i think i think that's lovely i think it i think we need to have more parades with it at the head of it yeah. in this town uh, uh be fun. meanwhile logan's got his truck out on the road and uh he has put a computer into a old old truck uh trey has just uh invested trey is uh, 14. Uh, Logan will be 17 in August. Uh, Trey has just invested in working out money to, he has a old Chevrolet, mm -hmm. a 1957 Chevrolet wow. that he is now going to fix up so he can drive it to high school uh, in a couple of three years probably to college as long as it's going to take to fix that car up <laughs> but he's that's that's uh we'll we'll learn we know a lot about ford trucks and now we're going to learn a lot about chevrolet uh 1957 chevrolets <laughs> and i think my lord that car was new the year that i graduated from college <laughs> <laughs> But I think I'm in a little bit better shape than that poor car is. I'll I, say I that. I believe that. I believe that. Well, it sounds like the kids have turned out pretty sharp. So right far, there. so good. So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> and both of them uh, are going to Notre Dame Academy. Uh, well, it's not an academy, you know. Notre Dame Regional Catholic High School mm -hmm. in Cape Girada. Uh, and... Uh, 
doing very, very well. Good. Uh, so uh, that's uh, so that means that I'm not so much involved, although con still concerned and aware of uh, uh, K-12 education here in Carbondale, which I think there's been some good leadership uh, and some good things happening. Uh, for example, to have SIU and Carbondale High School actually sitting down and making a, an agreement, an arrangement of working with students in high school to get them into either uh, a career, some kind of a career pattern or into a community college or a technical school or whatever they plan to do post high school and that is just a, a great thing yeah. because again that means that we will be having faculty members in especially the College of Education who will be actively involved in our school system and that's another good thing. So Now you made a little bit more clear as, as to what Edie did at SIU and, and, I, and I've got a little bit more of a question down that line to wanting to know you know how much of an impact she's had on on SIU being one of the most friendly, uh, you know, accessible campuses for their time over time. Uh, but before I get to that point, I, I what what all did you do at SIU throughout your tenure? Were you were you professor and lecturing? Were you managing different facilities? Were you doing a mix of both? What was what was your specific role, Emil? Well. I came as an assistant uh, dean of students. Uh, my major job when I first came was working with the recruitment and development of resident assistants in the residence halls. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I also worked a good deal with uh, fraternities and sororities, with student government, with student activities, with student organizations. Uh, so that came by, kind of became what was the student life aspect of student affairs, mm -hmm. the out of class activity. Uh, then I later be, was the Dean of Student Life and uh, student affairs is so much more than a building. Uh, it, we developed the recreation center, it, it, the student recreation really? center. I was involved in the planning of that building, uh, know it very well. I was overjoyed when uh, Bill Blyer was named the director of the student uh, recreation center. Mm -hmm. Bill was a wonderful person and he, he was the person who set the high standard for the faculty and uh, administrators in uh, recreation uh, here on campus. Uh, and we miss him much. Uh, How much do you think that that focus on recreation has kind of shaped the SIU as we know it now? Uh, just in terms of, of, you know, things like touch of nature, right? That, that may not be uh, as as large or as strong if there wasn't a focus put on recreation decades ago uh, in order for that to be an underpinning of, of life at Southern? Well, I know, I don't know much about the touch of nature now, but it was to be a, an outdoor laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you have Dr. Morris and Dr. Sandberg, uh, people who were dedicated to teaching students and uh, dedicated to their development. Uh, and I think that has been very, very important. Uh, I, I think that's one of the areas where, uh, where student and faculty c do come into contact with each other uh, because they're there at maybe using the facility at the same time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really don't know. It's interesting that I helped develop that building, and I very seldom have ever, have ever been in it <laughs> <laughs> after it's opened. Uh, what what year did it open? I couldn't tell you. couldn't tell you. I <laughs> ran in. 
I was going through some old papers and ran into the announcement about the opening reception the other day, but uh, so it had to be uh, in the mid to late 70s. Uh, but again, uh, well, another thing that we had, uh, and I guess we have it now, but uh, wheelchair basketball mm -hmm. was very big. Uh, we had teams that competed at the international level. Mm -hmm. uh, our friend uh, who worked with that uh, went to many international conferences uh, with his team. So uh, that that's another area. Uh, when it was mandated that uh, facilities be available, uh, in one sense, Southern lost out on some of that money to develop because we were already so handicap accessible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we, but we now have a uh, an elevator in Woody Hall, which we didn't have thanks to that federal money to help uh, make facilities, public facilities, handicap uh, available or disabled available, how, whichever word you want to use or mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. So Southern has been in the forefront of so many things. Uh, recently, I was reading the article about, and I think it was in the Southern Illinois, mm -hmm. about uh, SIU again being recognized uh, for its leadership in working with military and veterans. Mm -hmm. That's been a very important program. Uh, our teaching uh, on uh, uh, military bases has been important. Our outreach to prisons at one time, mm -hmm. uh, which we don't do anymore, but it was an important development. Uh, Southern has been such a leader in areas that you don't think a university does. You think of university as being up there on a hill somewhere, well, <laughs> yeah. not Southern. Very, very much in in the trench of life, not just some some like you said, shining city on a on a hill that's almost unattainable, <laughs> right? In, in inaccessible. Yeah, uh, and the uh, awards. Again, I've been away from it too long, but when I was involved in it. There was still the assumption that a faculty member was male, married, with children maybe, mm -hmm. and married to a housefrau. Mm -hmm. Now, that is just not the way life works. And even I, I remember very much how involved faculty wives were with students mm -hmm. uh, when I was a student. So uh, they weren't house frows. They were intelligent, busy, uh, intellectual women, uh, some of whom probably put their careers aside to become uh, uh, a faculty wife. And faculty wives were very important uh, to the university, uh, and they still are. Yeah, but but many like Edie were faculty wives, and at the same time, uh, <laughs> career people at the university. Yeah. So, what what would it? Have, I mean, because 1984 was the American disability with this the ADA, right? Like give or take. Uh, something like that. Uh, yeah. So that's I mean that's a whole 15 year span between when Edie would have started working for folks who needed the accessibility and when there was actual proper legislation in place to give her some of the support and assistance she needed. I mean, between in that 15 year gap, was there just, were there, uh, you know, roadblocks to success or was it completely embraced by the university and, and thought as something that enriched life as opposed to a nuisance because we felt like we had to serve people who, uh, you know, we would, we would otherwise just, 
uh, not consider? Uh, again, you have to go back to <clears throat> Dr. Morris. Yeah. Uh, somewhere along the line, he met somebody who needed and as an undergraduate, uh, I knew and worked with uh, what we then called handicapped students. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it was rougher because the town did not, didn't have the facilities we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, uh, when uh, Edie was uh, working with the handicapped students, uh, office and, and running the office and working with the students uh, th there was a real acceptance uh, well uh, Thompson Point mm -hmm. the first floor uh, of some of the residence halls at Thompson Point are handicap accessible mm -hmm. and those were built uh, Woody Hall was built I mean Woody Hall uh, uh, Thompson Point was built uh, probably in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, well, and no, it was earlier because uh, there was a tornado and uh, Anthony Hall had been turned into a men's residence hall mm -hmm. and the men at Anthony Hall were evacuated and moved to Thompson Point the night that the tornado was uh, uh, was supposedly going to hit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was an undergraduate at that point, <laughs> and when I was oh yeah, when I was in uh, my second year of uh, master's work, which would have been fifty eight fifty nine, uh, we were housing students at. Uh, uh, touch of nature mm -hmm. uh, because some of the residence halls were not complete yet at uh, Thompson Point and then as they got finished those students moved from uh, being out at touch of nature to uh, to being housed at uh, Thompson Point but back to the point my feeling is Southern again it, it led uh, it was a place that people came to find out, well, how does Southern do it? Mm -hmm. uh, and the, nobody was was moddy coddled. Nobody was expected not to do what they were expected to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were barriers still. Uh, well, it, it's... Uh, the uh, home ec building when it was built the the uh, only elevator was the one that went up to the uh, home ec, uh house where the ladies did their last year of work with the with students mm -hmm. uh, some of the doors were pretty hard to open uh, and you didn't have a something to hit to open the door you didn't have somebody necessarily standing there to open the door for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's so. Uh, well, the residence hall. Uh, when my fresh my uh, first year as a graduate student, the residence hall I lived in, right across from me, was uh, Deke Edwards, who was blind and who was a wrestler. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Deke just got recognized a year ago at homecoming and uh, we got to do some fun memory of interesting things uh, <laughs> Deke was blind the guy next door to him uh, had only one leg uh, so you know these were not unusual students yeah they were uh, just common welcome students Right. on the SIU campus. Right. I I would say that race relations have always been a problem. Uh, they're not a problem on the campus as much as they were uh, 
Well, Woody Hall was a women's residence hall when I came here. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no, there were no accommodation for African American students living accommodation on campus. Uh, we had the barracks, we had some integrated housing in the barracks, and but it took a while uh, to integrate even our residence halls, and uh, some people didn't like the fact that they were integrated. Uh, well, as, as recently as probably uh, 67, 68, something like that, mm -hmm. uh, Helen Hill was uh, the dean of students for the uh, part of East Campus. And one of the students, one of the white students was very upset that she was assigned a quote unquote black uh, suite mate. And her parents were going to go in to talk to the dean to get that solved and they were quite surprised to find out when they walked in to speak to uh, Dean Hill that Dean Hill was an African-American, <laughs> uh, a beautiful lady, well-educated uh, doctor and uh, the decision was, well, uh, the girls will should stay where they are and uh, if they really have personality problems not racial, but it's personality problems, mm -hmm. then we will work with that because that's part of our job. And uh, so uh, we, we still had people who came to Southern who were upset to find that there were, and we probably still do. Uh, and they're not all just from Southern Illinois. So we always have to deal with being aware of racial tensions. Uh, this building, uh, you know, the story of the it being integrated. Yes, when I was an undergraduate, uh, my first part of undergraduate, the uh, what we were then called black students. This was where they they sat here mm -hmm. in the balcony. Uh, yes, it was integrated. Uh, Dick Gregory was very much involved in that. Uh, it was integrated partly because, again, Dr. Morris informed the manager of the Varsity Theater that if his athletes could not sit where they wanted to sit when they came for a movie, then uh, the Varsity would have some problems. <laughs> can you expand on this a little bit more? I mean, do you, do you have more components to the story that you can share that, that you're aware of? I mean, whether it's whether it's actual you know sit-ins here at the varsity or it's things like what you're discussing now that president morris just kind of you know put his hand on the scale and said you either do or we have problems <laughs> well i'm sure there were many times that he did that uh well one good example was uh the library mm -hmm. uh the library was opened with a lot of empty floors mm -hmm. when it was opened it was basically a one floor maybe a two floor uh, library because dr morris said it is easier to get money to complete a building than it is to start a building mm -hmm. so he got the money to build the library mm -hmm. knowing that there were going there's going to be empty spaces because he could go back and get money to fill up those spaces rather easier than he could get money to build a building. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, he was a good politician. Uh, and Rendleman, who was in his uh, assistant, mm -hmm. uh, who also then was up at Edwardsville, you had both sides of the aisle covered. You had the Republican aisle covered and you had the Democrat aisle covered. <laughs> so it was, it was just a different era. 
uh, in higher education uh, than it is today. Well, sp speaking of eras specifically, one, one of the things that, that we had talked about just, just in passing, uh, you know, a couple months ago when I, when I first was like, hey, I'd, I'd like to have Emil on and, and stop by out at, out at the park here, uh, you know, several weeks back, uh, you'd, you'd made a mention of just uh, some of the folks from your era that you feel like deserve some of the credit they may not be getting for their efforts in, uh, you know, here at, at the universe. I mean, are there some folks that kind of stick out in your mind that are just made grand contributions to this place, but don't necessarily have their name etched in stone somewhere? Oh, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> well, naming buildings is so political that you don't name them necessarily after somebody just because they have been a wonderful member of your higher education community. Yeah. Uh, but there's a book out, and there's a chapter in that book about uh, student affairs. It's about housing without mentioning the people who really developed housing. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, a mention about the rec center without mentioning Bill, uh, Bill at all. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no mention of Wilbur Moulton, who was a student affairs. There is no mention of uh, uh, any of the vice presidents of student affairs that I know of in, in that uh, chapter. Uh, it's a chapter about uh, probably a very good history of housing, but it's not a good chapter of student affairs because, and it does not mention some of the people who really developed student affairs here uh, in in the 50s or uh, in, in the book says this deals basically with the last 50 years. Uh, well, let's just put it this way. I read the book and I thought, I wonder where that was. <laughs> because, we, we missed it just a little bit. <laughs> well, I lived, I worked. And that, this was when I was working at SIU Carbondale. This is, this is part of your story. And the student affairs chapter is horrible. Not, it's horrible because it's not a, it is not about student affairs. Yeah. It's about housing with a little mention of the rec building and the health service. Uh, whoever wrote it seems to think that student affairs has to be in there has to be a building mm -hmm. well student affairs is so much more than a building mm -hmm. uh, student affairs is student government student affairs is uh, health service student affairs is rehab student affairs is uh, all the support that you need outside the classroom Mm -hmm. It's about life outside the classroom and how to enrich that life and how to enrich the classroom experience as well. Uh, that's what student affairs is supposed to be all about. And that's what I feel that student affairs was about in the 50 years that I worked as part of it. Now, that's, as a friend of mine would say, that's not a prejudice, that's a conviction. Do you feel like the town that is Carbondale has provided the space that you feel like you needed as a student affairs professional to provide that other piece the to development of you know the young mind or you know uh, students or, or or however you want to want to you know refer to folks who are in in college do you feel like and when I and when I say carbon, I don't necessarily mean like, oh, was the city government a good partner, or was the the you know this that the other. I mean, it's more just was was the place that is Carbondale, a 
a place that really did help to fill in that other half of, of student development, which is the development outside of the classroom? Um, it, we're trying. The community <laughs> is trying. Yeah. Uh, in some, it bothers me that I read things in the paper that says, you know, uh, let's bring back uh, more bars. Let's open, you know, uh, we, we, we're just not the, the center of Good Time Charlie. Mm -hmm. Well, we never were the center of Good Time Charlie. <laughs> but there, I think the community is a welcoming community. Yeah. Uh, it truly is. Uh, at one time, so, uh, Carbondale, there was a real difference between the railroad-oriented Carbondale and the SIU-oriented Carbondale. Mm -hmm. I think these have begun to merge partly <laughs> because uh, the railroad is not as involved we're not as involved with railroad as we once were mm -hmm. uh, and partly uh, because uh, the the university has become such a part of the of Carbondale you can't really separate the two yeah you can talk about the difference in governing but you also have to listen to the fact that those people down in City Hall are well aware of those people on the campus, and those people on the campus are well aware of those people in City Hall. Yeah. And I think they're working better together. Uh, that's that's the good way to put yeah. the bow tie on right. it. I, well, the so I've I've, I've kind of th there was one more thing that I want to touch on, um, just kind of as as we as we near the end on this conversation, Emil, and it, it's because. Uh, there uh, another another set of folks that I'm looking to have on the podcast are folks from the community foundation, um, and just getting a little bit on on how uh, you and Edie kind of landed in in place to help start the the community foundation and how that all the the Southern Illinois Community Foundation and how that all just kind of came came together in the early 2000s. For you know we we've already talked about. You know that service to the community is a huge part of of the work that that you both have done and in the work that just SIU kind of commands from its folks. But something like the community foundation is so much more than just oh well we volunteer here or there from time to time. It's really putting skin in the game to support uh, you know an ecosystem of of services throughout the community. Um. Well, the Southern Illinois Community Foundation, uh, to me, is the opportunity for people uh, who financially are able, and that does not mean you have to be rich, mm -hmm. but you have a little extra change that you want to do something good with. Yeah. And the foundation gives that opportunity that wasn't there before. Uh, I don't think that the two are in competition, the uh, SIU Foundation and Southern Illinois Foundation. Mm -hmm. They speak to different interests and to different purposes, and they work together well, I believe. Uh, I find the foundation to be made up, uh, its governing board, the people who work with it, are truly concerned about giving people an opportunity to help uh, others, uh, to create uh, some funds that are available that otherwise would not be available. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, let, let's say somebody builds a uh, a building for uh, a charity. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, for example, you could even say, and I don't know that this has happened, but if Carbondale Community Arts 
there is a way of contributing to Carbondale Community Arts by contributing to the found Southern Illinois Foundation and yeah. saying this money is to be used for Carbondale Community Arts as a way of ensuring that that building they have gets a new roof when it's needed. Yeah. I mean, to, to manage endowments for projects throughout the Southern Illinois region. Yeah. And, and so often buildings are built and there's no money. Well, look at the varsity. Mm -hmm. What happened? <laughs> the varsity became available because there was no, no money mm -hmm. in anybody's uh, will to make sure that the varsity b building mm -hmm. was maintained. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so we need a foundation like the Southern Illinois Community Foundation that looks and works with specific needs in the, in the community that may not be able to be written into a, a state grant or a mm -hmm. federal grant or something. So it's a charity that you can look at and say, I have this need, mm -hmm. is there a way you can help me with it? And knowing the people there, I would say they, if they said, no, we can't help you with it, but now we can help find out who can help you. Yep. Uh, so it does a lot of good work that way. And, and I've, I've just having gotten the opportunity to see some of Byram's work firsthand in the CEO position in, in recent years uh, and to see some of the depth of projects that they've taken on, right? They're, they're really taking their work in helping to legitimize any number of other nonprofits or programs throughout the region. Right. And just, you know, I, it was, it was, you know, to, to when, when we had that, that inaugural philanthropy speaks activity and, and for, for you and Edie to have the, you know, the, the service to the organization award, kind of the first kind of lifetime piece there. It was just, it was good to, it was good to see and good to be a part of. And I appreciate yeah, that. And that, that was a really unexpected reward. We, we were invited to come to the the meeting and and had not the faintest idea why we were invited to, <laughs> to come to that meeting. And I hope that reward continues to be given annually or when the foundation finds that there's a need to, not a need, but a want to recognize somebody. Yeah. Uh, and uh, ours came about because uh, we looked to the foundation as a way of knowing there would be some a legitimate organization that the Science Center, the African American Museum, uh, uh, several other that they knew that there would be money that they could go to the foundation and say, can you help me with this? Yeah. Uh, where they didn't have necessarily their own foundation or didn't have the resources to create a foundation. Yep. Because a foundation has to have a board and it has to have people who keep running it. Mm -hmm. And you, so you can't expect the Science Center to have its quote own foundation or the African American uh, museum to have its quote un own foundation mm -hmm. uh, so it's a way of centralizing a lot of this work that otherwise just may not occur like it needs to right yeah. uh, I mean they they do all the paperwork and the administrivia that then the person who is volunteering at the Science Center or at the African American Museum can put their efforts into day-to-day -day operations of being with the people, creating things for children, creating things for adults, running uh, information programs uh, like the Science Center did uh, several year, uh, for several years, the kind of off co evening coffee hour programs. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, I, I'm, I'm very high on the Southern Illinois Community Foundation. Highly recommended. You got to, 
you got a piece of money you want to get put to good use, contact the Southern Illinois Community Foundation. <laughs> and that is that is it. We put to good use the breakaway to the camera. Uh, as I as I told Emil before the show, I said if you've got something serious to say, you can look dead into the camera and say it as you see fit. And to support the Community Foundation, I think was the perfect use of that breakaway to the camera. And this, we hope, has been a perfect use uh, of some of your time watching episode seventy five of the WTF Carbondale podcast. This one uh, with Carbondale legend Emil Spees. Uh, and as I always say, folks, have a good one. Whatever that one may be.